Welcome back to the Disruptors Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Johnson. Video games have obviously taken the world by storm, but when most people think of them, they think of something that folks do as purely entertainment with little practical value to their lives. But the promise of games goes way beyond mere distraction. The modalities and mechanics of games can actually be used to develop skills in ways that would be impossible to acquire otherwise. My guest today is Sam Glassenberg, and after earning his stripes as a game developer at LucasArts and Microsoft, he stumbled almost by accident upon an opportunity to help doctors become much better at their jobs. The result was Level X, a gaming company that helps surgeons and other physicians improve through simulations of real-world medical situations. And today he has over 500,000 physicians playing his games regularly, a partnership with NASA, among others, and uh, a really uh, thriving business. And in this episode, we discuss the origins of Level X, how Sam thinks about game mechanics to drive user adoption, why these types of games offer unique advantages in terms of uh, adoption and monetization, the future of VR, and much more. Uh, I got a lot out of this, thought it was super fascinating. I think you will too. So with that, let's go to Sam. All right, Sam, thanks so much for being here. Really excited to get into Level X and, and what you're up to currently. But before we get into that, you're, you're, you're the first person I've ever met or interviewed that has an Emmy. Um, <laughs> why don't we start with how, how that, that story, how did that happen? Well, first I should qualify, it's a technical Emmy. So it's, oh, in that it's case, not the never, one. Never, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying it's it's not the one they show on TV. It's the one they do beforehand. You know, it's not for acting or anything. Um, so the technical Emmy, um, I accepted it on behalf of uh, my team at Microsoft. Got it. Um, a few roles ago, I've I've spent my career in the video games industry. My team at Microsoft was responsible uh, for. It, it was called DirectX. It's the, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's basically the graphics mm-hmm. technology platform behind Xbox, PC gaming, mm-hmm. all the technologies that we defined and standardized eventually made make their way into your phones. This is how video games create, you know, ultra realistic images. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, our job was to plan, predict, define the next five to 10 years of video game graphics technology. And so the, the technical Emmy was for, you know, pushing the cutting edge of interactive entertainment. So how does someone who makes video games for a living figure out that they can help doctors? How, talk, walk through that journey for us. How did you kind of get to where you are now? So in short, by accident. Okay. Um, you know, I've had a fairly successful career in the video game business. Um, I started out actually at LucasArts, um, okay. Lucasfilm making Star Wars games. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, I bet. Um, after that, after that, Microsoft working, uh, working on, on the DirectX team. Um, after that, I joined a uh, early stage game company um, that we pivoted uh, to basically make a uh, mobile video game company for Hollywood. So doing games for all the big Hollywood movies like Hunger Games and Mission Impossible and Rocky. Uh, that's where I've I've spent my career, which at the same time has sort of made me the the black sheep of the family. Okay. Um, because okay. I, I I come from a long line of doctors. Yeah, my my grandfather was a famous doctor. He was actually like the senior editor at the Journal of the American Medical Association. Oh wow. Um, my parents oh, wow. are both doctors. My wife is a doctor. Aunts, uncles. I'm the one who never went to medical school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so say, speaking of the Emmy, when uh, so when I found out we, were, we we won and I was going to be accepting it, I called my parents right to be like, hey, you know, walking down the red carpet, my dad without skipping a beat, right? He had no idea this was coming. Goes, oh, okay, Sam, yeah, that's very nice, but in this family, we only recognize Nobel prizes. He goes, you're not yet thirty years old. <laughs> You can still go to medical school. I'll pay for it. Wow. So that's, uh, I'm sure there are, there are years of therapy. <laughs> right, right. So how does this, so, right, so how does this parlay then into, into a company that makes video games for doctors? So back yeah. in 2012, my father, he's an anesthesiologist, he gives up and he says, all right, fine. You're not going to medical school. So at least put all this gaming stuff to good use. Make me a game to train my colleagues to do a fiber optic intubation. The procedure itself doesn't matter so much. Bottom line is it's a it's it's difficult and you only do it on rare difficult scenarios. So, you know, okay. So it, it's it's hard to train, right? And so even, you know, even experienced yeah. folks may struggle with it if they haven't done enough cases. So he goes, "Look, just make me a game they can play on their phones to teach them how to do this. I don't want to drag anybody to a simulation center." 
So literally out of guilt, I sat down for three weekends with some video game technology, a video game engine, because um, I was yeah. you know, busy doing other things. Um, so I sat down for three weekends and I threw together this game for him. And uh, it was pretty bad. Um, and uh, and uh, I uploaded it to the App Store. And, and the reason I did that was simply because, you know, I was busy running a game company, um, didn't have time sure. to install it on his friend's iPhones one by one. So, you know, here's the link. They can download it themselves. Uh, leave me alone. Uh, didn't think yeah. about it again. And then two years later in 2014, he calls me. He goes, hey, Sam, how many people downloaded that thing? And I go, I, I have no idea how many of your friends downloaded your game, but I'll check for you. And I went and I looked, and we had 100,000 doctors, nurses, and airway oh specialists gosh. worldwide who'd been playing this thing. Had by that's accident created incredible. a very popular medical training tool. Yeah, that's like how everybody wishes things would go. That's amazing. Um, so... I, a bunch of questions. Uh, first of all, how, how, you, your dad tells you to build a, a a game for a very complex procedure, and in three weekends you you do it. How did you know what to build for the initial kind of version of that? I mean, it seems like this would be a pretty technical exercise for folks to complete. How did you figure out what that thing was supposed to do, and what you know what the mechanics would be around that? Um, well, I mean, my my dad had been trying to get me to go to medical school for decades at that point. Um, I'd actually <laughs> scrubbed up. He, he got me scrubbed up a few times to actually observe like open heart surgeries and things. So um, I'd oh, actually wow. seen a number of intubations. He had had me, um, you know, practice intubating on a mannequin um, a number of times. I certainly like, <laughs> don't get me wrong. I was, you know, was not ready to do it on a human, but I, I knew yeah. enough about it. Uh, he had sent me a lot of videos. So I had a lot of visual reference on what it looked like. Um, and yeah, so, yeah. you know, I was able to, wow. to just, you know, bang something out quick enough that fairly represented the, the, the procedure. Although what, what shocked me is, so when I discovered we had the, the, the hundred thousand users, I'm like, all right, well, you know, I, I Google it, right? Like I literally just type yeah. the thing into Google and I discover unbeknownst yeah. to me, they've been doing efficacy studies on this app at various institutions around the world that shows it improves physician performance. I mean, were you able even to kind of deconstruct how this thing, it sounds like it went relatively viral just through kind of word of mouth. I mean, were you able to kind of deconstruct at all kind of how this took off the way that it did? You know, I think, I mean, I think just like you described it, word of mouth, I'm guessing the efficacy studies probably got some publicity that people saw. So that may have caused people mm -hmm. to download it. I, you know, I was always shocked, like, you know, years later you encounter anesthesiologists and, you know, they would have it on their phone. <laughs> so yeah, that was the so, that was the motivation for starting Level X. So you've got this you've got this product now. You know, how do you how do you go from this thing that's just sort of sitting there kind of in the in the in the background and realizing that you've kind of legitimately got something there? What well, walk through sort of the transition from it sounds like you were you were or kind of already doing something else and then uh, you make the decision to kind of formalize this and stand up a, a company behind it. What was that process like? So first I should, I, I sat on that audience for a while, right? So this was, okay. you know, and then I started, you know, understanding the, so a, after my last company was acquired, um, then I started looking, oh, okay, is there something interesting to do, to do here? And I started understanding the continuing education business, the physician marketing business. I mean, ultimately, you know, there's, just so many companies and medical societies and, you know, everyone is, you know, there's so much vested interest in keeping doctors up to speed on the latest products, the latest techniques, the latest sure. best practices that, you know, there's yeah. actually, it, it supports a pretty wide range of business models. I um, mean, clearly we had seen yeah. this incredible demand for this right. kind of content. I mean, remember when I launched this thing, I had probably 10 minutes worth of content in it. Right, I look at that and I'm yeah. like, you know, coming from the games industry, we know how to engage people for tens or hundreds of hours, right? When we really yeah. put, you know, right. top people toward the problem of, you know, how do you make things fun and challenging and engaging? You know, that was the that was the motivation, right? Let's put together a team of, you know, not just like let's put together a team of top video game developers, designers, artists from around the industry, you know, folks who've worked on everything, you know, worked at Disney, Activision, EA, Warner Brothers, Zynga, and you know, put mm -hmm. them on this challenge, right? Of how do you create 
you know, the ultimate content for doctors and other medical professionals. So just for folks that, that and, and, and obviously we're over audio, so it's a little difficult to kind of imagine, but how, how, I guess, how does the product sort of work in a nutshell? It sounds like you've got these tasks or missions or something like that, that they complete and it's supposed to kind of simulate sort of a real life situation. Is that, is that fair? Yeah. So the way I would describe it. So first off, when I say 10 minutes, that was just that app that I had done for my dad. Yeah, so right yeah. now, Level X, we have four games in the market um, and a number more launching. Okay. We actually have half a million medical professionals playing them now. Um, and wow. you know they engage, I mean, there's a lot more content, it's fun, it's replayable. You know They're coming back over and mm -hmm. over again to play the latest cases and, and content that we release. So the, the, the way to think about yeah. it is we are capturing the challenges of medical practice um, as video game mechanics. You know, for surgery, that's kind of obvious, right? You know, finding, you know, hidden polyps, uh, you know, in, in the colon, right? That's, you know, like a hidden object game or, you know, removing yeah. things might be more like a, a physics puzzle or a first person shooter. Um, we have our mm -hmm. interventional cardiology game um, that, uh, uh, that launched recently. We have one in four interventional cardiologists in the country playing it. Um, that's a it's a Jeez. puzzle game. You said one in four. One Did in you say four. one in four? Yeah, one in four. There. That's incredible. There. It's it's basically it's a puzzle game um, played under fluoroscopy. So the entire game is played under X ray, and there's you know a live beating human heart in front of you, right in the chest cavity under X ray, and you need to manipulate these guide wires and stents through a live beating human heart to restore blood flow. You know when there's uh, uh, when you know when there's when there's damage or you know calcified lesions in the heart. Um, deploying, you know, the right wow. sequence of stents and other tools. So this is like, you know, these are some of the procedural challenges. And then beyond that, mm -hmm. I mean, f medicine is this incredibly challenging career. So you can think about things like, how do you diagnose a patient, right? A difficult diagnosis. How do you manage a patient over time if they have, you know, multiple comorbidities or you're trying to balance, you know, side effects of different drugs or, or different treatments? These are puzzle games. These are strategy games, right? When we think about it from a game mechanics perspective. So what we're doing is we're taking yeah. the top video game designers and developers in the country, and we're putting them on the, you know, on the mission of capturing those challenges, right? Of the practice of medicine, be they clinical or procedural and capturing them as video game mechanics. And then once they've done that, the levels themselves, more often than not, are real cases that have been submitted by doctors. Right in that discipline. Oh, neat! Yeah, Very so cool. we have we have crazy and I would imagine cases, that they're yeah. playing it over and over again to try to beat almost like beat their score or whatever, kind of cement. They're uh, obviously they're cementing learning in the process, but you're doing it in a way where they they're sort of self motivated to kind of complete this. Exactly, it's fun, it's challenging. So an exa an example would be you know we have a case uh, that was submitted by the head of the Advanced Bronchoscopy Society, real case. Uh, actually was from Chicago, Carpenter is holding a bunch of nails in his mouth while he's hammering, accidentally inhales one, punctures his bronchus, right? So there's oh this gosh. whole puzzle yeah. of you've got this embedded nail, it's covered in mucus, and you know it's embedded and and how do you remove it right and it's actually there's a specific manipulations that you need to do with a bronchoscope to get it at the right angle to try to remove it without causing massive bleeding and so these are the kinds of puzzles that we're able to capture that you know accurately represent the scenario that you know that the doctor encountered in the operating room you mentioned continuing education uh, a few minutes ago I, if i understand correctly you 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 kind of i figured out a way through this to actually have the them playing this game count towards continuing education credit is that is that right? Correct, correct. So, and, um, okay. What happens is so you know what we're doing is doctors are submitting the most interesting, difficult, challenging cases, right? For you know you to play yeah. over and over again, and we actually score you based on you know how they would score you: time, blood loss, tissue damage, and so forth, accuracy. Okay. In certain cases, yeah. right, when we find the content, we have over, so right now we're working with over 150 physician advisors in different specialties. And when they tell us that certain content not only you know is fun and challenging, but also closes specific educational gaps, we then go through, that content goes through a CME approval process. So doctors can actually, so if you play our games, there's a whole bunch of levels and cases in there where you can earn continuing medical education credit toward renewing your medical license. And those cases go through sort of another level of review 
um, prior to uh, mm -hmm. prior to that certification. So all of the cases that we release have been you know have been uh, peer reviewed by doctors to you know validate that yeah. they're accurate. But then we go through an additional uh, level of review to validate that it um, that it you know closes educational gaps for the content that that gets CME credit. I would imagine, I mean, healthcare obviously doesn't have, doesn't necessarily have a reputation for being particularly innovative. I would imagine that that is a, that was a very different sell to them than maybe what they were used to. How did, I mean, was it, was it super easy to kind of convince sort of these governing bodies to, that, that, that this should count uh, as credit or was there a process you had to go through? What, what was that like? So, um, I mean, there happen? was definitely a process that we've gone through. What I'll tell you is, I mean, Doctors have actually been rebelling against these certifications um, for a multitude of reasons. Huh. Um, and, and one of them being, I mean, look, the vast majority of CME content, if you're you know, outside of like attending conferences, is literally, you know, you watch a lecture, you read an article, and you complete a multiple choice test. You know, nothing has changed in decades. Yeah. How does that multiple choice test necessarily validate your skills as a surgeon or your, you know, real decision-making skills or your real ability to diagnose something. You know, there's been, because of that, and you know, that sentiment from doctors is widely known, right? So when you come in and you're like, yeah. look, this stuff works, doctors clearly want yeah. it. But as you can see, you know, this is clearly, I mean, this is not only is it, you know, um, you know, not only is it credible and accurate and everything, else, it's better than, you know, yeah. the traditional modalities of multiple choice. You have this sort yeah. of, you know, this win across multiple fronts where, you know, yes, it's going to, sure, it's going to achieve all the educational goals, but at the same time, it's doing what everybody know, like what the CME ecosystem knows is needed to actually yeah. make this interesting. I mean, it relevant. seems like it would be really difficult to learn how to, you sent, you mentioned some of these really difficult cases. I mean, it seems like it would be incredibly difficult to learn how one would navigate that in any other any other way. Was there even an option? Were there either, I mean, what, what was the closest kind of proxy to what you've done here in terms of dealing with some of these real difficult situations? It seems like you'd almost, it'd almost be like doing it on, a, on an actual patient. I mean, I don't know, how, how do they learn? Yeah. Kind of stuff? So we have lots of stories at Level X of what happens when video game developers discover the state of the art in medical training. Um, these stories mm -hmm. all sort of follow a similar arc. I mean, basically, for the most part, doctors are learning, um, especially the tricky and rare stuff, they're learning on live human beings. Um, and that's not, yeah. it's simply because they're not, it's not because they want to, it's simply because they're not given any better option. You know, the, the state of the art is, you know, you have cadaver labs, right? Where you can do procedures mm -hmm. on cadavers, but cadavers don't bleed, right? There's a lot of limitations yeah. to that. They don't present difficult scenarios. So, you know, this, yeah. you know, nail in the airway scenario, right? can only the first time you deal with that, it's going to be on a live human being. And the state of the art and sort of digital virtual medical simulation, we are, again, as video game developers, consistently shocked because this stuff all looks like video games out of the 1990s. And so, you know, the yeah. doctors that actually play, you know, the doc, the large audience of doctors that play video games, right, will go into their simulation and training center and be like, what, this feels like something I played on the Nintendo 64. Like it's not a very accurate depiction. In terms of the, the continuing education thing, how, how effective has that been as a, as a channel and either as a channel in terms of driving adoption? I mean, obviously it's, it's a, it's a strong incentive for them to do it. Are there, is there an upside in terms of them from a promotion perspective, helping you kind of uh, drive additional adoption for this? So, I mean, the, the way we think about I mean, yeah, see, so for the CME is a, is a reward, right? Um, from a video game yeah, design yeah. perspective, um, it's a reward. It's yeah. just more value that we can provide. Um, the majority mm -hmm. of our players don't even use it for CME, the majority of our doctors. Um, oh, okay. You know, often, okay. you know, if you earn your CME, you know, if you're at, at an academic institution, uh, chances are you don't need additional CME. You're getting it from, you know, um, from teaching residents and, and, and grand rounds and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. you know, for a, a good proportion of our audience, CME is a motivator, but really what is driving, you know, our activity, growth, engagement, it's the fun of, you know, capturing the, the challenges of, of medical practice. This is how doctors learn. There's a reason why, yeah. you know, yeah. doctors open a medical journal every month or attend medical conferences. It's because they're lifelong yeah. learners. They're, you know, intellectually yeah. curious. They want to understand about the latest techniques, the most difficult cases. And what we're providing them with is just a better modality of doing that. Instead of just reading about it, 
you know, or hearing about it vicariously, you can actually try it yourself and try different approaches and compete with yourself and with colleagues to get the best outcome. I mean, it seems like it's one of those things where, you know, you talk, everybody talks a lot about product market fit and a lot of people think that they have it and they, they don't. It's, it's, this seems like exhibit A of like build a legitimately superior product and folks will almost kind of flock, flock to you. That was certainly case, obviously the case in the, in the beginning as you've kind of continued to grow though, has, has growth continued to mostly be a function of word of mouth or are there other channels that you found to be particularly effective for reaching doctors? I know a lot of, a lot of startups and a lot of kind of players in the healthcare space, getting the physician on board is one of kind of their key uh, objectives or key needs in order to kind of make the thing viable. Is there anything that you've learned there about reaching physicians or has it entirely been a game of just word of mouth for you all? Right. So, um, uh, we we've hired so a number of factors. So one we've I mean hired a team of top folks from digital health. You know our chief business officer was the former head of marketing for Medscape, which you know is uh, okay. you know leading um, app and 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 website for doctors. So you know experience reaching doctors. Um, I mean yeah it's not all word of mouth. We do a lot of digital marketing through a wide uh, we're sort of digital and physical marketing through a range of channels. So yeah. um, you know we're yeah. doing direct yeah. user acquisition. We're doing. Uh, promotion, you know, at conferences, we're doing partnerships with major medical societies like American Heart Association and uh, and others, um, and it all it all comes together. I mean, ultimately, what we find with this is we build, you know, just incredible looking stuff um, and incredibly yeah. fun and engaging content, right? That you know, yeah. Yeah. turns heads, and all we have to do is show that to doctors, and immediately they download it. So, you know, our digital marketing it. is showing just video footage of the games and promoting that, mm -hmm. right? And then doctors mm -hmm. download and play mm -hmm. or, you know, showing it to them in a conference booth and letting them play for a few minutes in a conference booth. And then, whoa, I need to have this on my phone. You mentioned uh, as you started digging into this in a little more detail when you were when you're looking at standing it up, that one of the other kind of upsides was the myriad of ways in which you could kind of monetize this. What is the, because if I understand it correctly, you're not, the, the, the physicians aren't paying for it. Um, so, so how does the revenue model work and maybe how did you kind of arrive at it or how did you kind of decide of these dozen different ways in which I could monetize it? This was uh, potentially the most viable or most effective. Sure. Doctors, you know, are an incredibly sought after audience, right? They're very, very yep. busy. Yep. Um, but I mean, they, they influence all of the healthcare spend in the country. And, yeah. you know, on top of it, it's just, you know, everybody wants to be training them. Um, everybody wants to be bringing them up to speed on the latest products. And so really the, you know, the opportunities that we, that we saw, I mean, physician marketing oh. is just a massive uh, ecosystem. Um, there's, you know, tremendous amount of, of spend there and we can be far more effective yeah. at it. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of like- Through like native at like in-game promotion or how, how does that how does Yeah, that so work? basically, I mean, yeah, similar to the model that we would do in games, right? Where you have- yeah. Um, sponsored content. We have sponsored content in our games. Um, only got it. <clears throat> instead of you know, there's this. I mean, you know, the the physician marketing ecosystem is tens of billions of dollars, right? Pharma alone, I think, spends over right. over twenty. 23, 24 billion just to market to doctors. Um, so it's a, it's a massive yeah. ecosystem, but it's mostly, I mean, in digital, it's banner advertising. It's, right. it's obstructive. It's I'm trying to open up an app and check a reference on something and I'm being bombarded by banner ads or, you know, pop-up videos that I don't want to watch. And right. so we flip that around and we say, all right, well, hold on. You know, doctors actually are interested in discovering the latest treatments, the latest, you know, devices, you know, training on them, understanding how they can provide value for their patients. They just don't want to hear about it from a banner ad. And so how do we, how do we make that better? And so what we've done is, you know, if you, if you open up our games, you'll find we've, it's all opt in. You come into the games, sure. there's a bunch of, you know, challenging cases that have been submitted by doctors, there's CME cases, then there's sponsored cases where, you know, you can literally using AR, project a virtual patient onto your desk and then try different different laryngoscopes to intubate the patient. We have other oh, games wow. where you okay. actually play as the drug, right? So you're literally playing as the molecule, right? To understand how it works because doctors oh, you know, cool. don't like, for good reason, they don't like prescribing drugs or they don't understand the, what we call the mechanism of action, how the drug works. So what we'll do is we'll literally let you, doctors want to learn about it, but this is a much better way to do it. You literally play as the drug. You know, you might have companies that are, you know, want doctors to be aware of, you know, rare diseases that they're indicated for. We can create fun game levels where they diagnose those diseases. So that's where, 
Um, so it's opt-in for the doctors. And what we discover is we actually, we have spon our sponsored content not only gets played by the doctors, it gets replayed. You know, we'll have like, you know, these, these cases that I'm talking about that are sponsored by med device companies or pharma companies or even medical societies that are trying to disseminate their best practices, you know, we'll create these levels that are sponsored. You play for a minute, minute and a half. Doctors will replay them over and over again. Right. So they're they're opting wow. in to spend four to seven minutes in sponsored content because it's interesting and because it's fun and because it's engaging and rewarding. It makes a ton of sense. Backing up a, a, a little bit, you know, in tech, there, there a lot of folks talk about this idea of kind of a minimum viable product and using lean startup. And I would imagine that with games, that is considerably more difficult. Are there any strategies that that, that game designers are able to use to kind of make that easier, either when they're initially sort of going to market or um, you're spinning up a campaign for a pharma company? Is there any sort of iteration work that happens there? Any way of kind of testing or validating these things? Like what, how do you think about that type of stuff in terms of getting to market or iterating um, a little bit more quickly? Or is it just not something you can really do with game design? No, so you, you certainly can. And we, it's, it's play testing is really, and there are you know, different types of play testing is incredibly valuable. Um, I mean, ultimately, okay. what is fun, right? Fun is very subjective. The, the exercise of game design is this art and a science. You're taking this, you know, the science of sort of the, the neuroscience of engagement and fun, of dopamine release, using economics, and you're combining that with an art of really sort of understanding intuitively what is fun, but ultimately you don't know until you test it. And so, yeah. you know, the games industry is incredibly competitive. You have hundreds of high quality games launching in the app store and on every pla on these platforms every single week. The bar is incredibly yeah. high to create something that that is that is fun and engaging. The way we do that is we are constantly, constantly play testing and iterating. So, you know, games are designed, they're heavily, heavily, heavily instrumented so we can tweak um, and we can make adjustments and we can do it dynamically over time, even after the game launches. Um, prior to launch, yeah. you're doing a lot of prototyping, um, testing those prototypes to the extent that you can, um, and then continuing mm -hmm. to evolve those prototypes before you launch anything. So in games- And I imagine you're, you're folding physicians into that process as well, um, and not just the developers themselves. Oh so. yes, yes, hundred, I mean literally, yeah hundreds upon hundreds of physicians. So we, any given day in the Level X offices, you've got you know physicians that are coming through, playing games and levels at different stages of development. They might be playing an early, like sometimes they might be playing something that's not digital at all. They're literally playing a paper yeah. prototype using cards and you know, literally like sort of board game elements to try to capture the challenge of you know, an aspect of medicine. Or they might be playing a level you know, that in an app that's already launched and we're about to release, you know, this new sequence of levels or cases in the app and they're, you know, just testing that to make sure it's accurate before it goes out. We are testing everything um, as frequently as we possibly can um, to, you know, to, to iterate because yeah, obviously, I mean, as you know, just in games as with any other software or product, you know, the later you make the change, the more expensive it is. You mentioned game mechanics. That's a, you know, as a mechanism to kind of increase adoption, increase the amount of playing cycles. And this is effectively, I mean, it is a, it is a game, but, um, are there for folks that are listening, you know, people bandy about, they, they use the phrase gamification a lot and they, in a lot of cases, it's like, let's slap some badges onto something or whatever. Are there strategies that you've sort of learned over the years that you think are maybe a little bit more broadly applicable um, in terms of applying game mechanics, especially when you're thinking of like non-game type experiences that that can increase uh, engagement, but are more effective than than slapping slapping badges onto a, onto a product. There are a number of areas to to just to break apart here. So okay. first off, I find that more often than not, when what people are looking for are shortcuts. Right. What is the thing that I can slap on to my experience that is fundamentally not fun, not interesting, maybe not even interactive to make it fun? And that's, you know, usually, I mean, gamification is a great term, but unfortunately it's stigmatized because every example of gamification that ever comes up is let's take this content that isn't fun and we'll throw on a bet, we'll throw on a quiz. <laughs> and then in exchange for completing the quiz, we will give you a badge. And, right. you know, and now right. we will take this content that is not fun and it will automatically be fun. And, you know, right. first off, quizzes have never been fun. They weren't fun in the <laughs> second grade and they're not fun now. And badges like 
we stole that from the Girl Scouts. Like we didn't even invent that in the games industry. What you're trying to do is sort of slut, you know, scrape off the most shallow, topmost, obvious layer of games, and then oh, it's going to make my thing fun and engaging. Game design yeah. is an incredibly deep discipline, right? We just sort of I, I mm. mentioned in passing sort of this art and a science, and there's neuroscience and economics, and 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 like yeah. this goes incredibly deep. Over the last few yeah. decades, you know, we have been testing these methodologies over a billion players, right? Over dozens of product cycles. Like we have a deep, yeah. deep understanding of how the brain works and that drives true game design. The example mm -hmm. I'll give you, think back to like the first time you, have you played Angry Birds? Oh yeah. Have you ever wondered why Angry Birds is so addictive? It's, it's actually evolutionary. So if you think back okay. to the first time you played Angry Birds, right? What happened? You pulled the bird back in the slingshot, you fired, and you missed, and you mm -hmm. got super frustrated. You got frustrated. Second bird hops into the slingshot, you pull it back, you fire, you get a little closer to that tower of pigs, but you still miss, and you get more frustrated, right? And the frustration builds. Third time, bird hops mm -hmm. in, you fire, it's glorious. There's explosions and animations and pigs flying everywhere and sound effects and physics. And what is that? What is the purpose of all of that? That triggers a dopamine release in the brain, right? The buildup of frustration yeah, yeah. and then that moment of reward triggers a dopamine release, right? What does that do? That reinforces yeah. the neural pathways that you literally used on the last fire. That's how humans mm -hmm. learn. That's why two hours later you're firing that bird in between two narrow obstacles with precision. These yeah. neuromechanics, we didn't invent this in the games industry. We've evolved this way. This is how our ancestors learned how to throw a spear, right? This is how mammals yeah. have learned for tens of millions of years, right? These dopamine pathways. Yeah. And what the video games industry has figured out is what are those, right? What is rewarding? What is frustrating? How do you balance reward and frustration? How do you time it correctly? So, you know, you're yeah. triggering big rewards at a low frequency, small rewards at a high frequency, keeping people in a flow state. So the challenge yeah. versus mm -hmm. the skill level is balanced. Like this is really deep. Um, and so yeah. how do you use this? You actually have to hire talented, experienced game designers who understand this. Right, the same way you would need to understand, you would need mm -hmm. to hire a talented, experienced engineer, right, to go and build complex software. There's no shortcut. Same right. goes with game design. Like you can do it, and and you can deliver a, you know, get amazing returns on it. But you need, you can't shortcut it. And yeah. the other thing I would also note is there is also fantasy in the work that we're doing here, right? Some mm -hmm. of those, a lot of the game levels are real cases submitted by doctors. A lot of them, yep, are what we call, you know, they're more fantastical cases where we start creating cases. We go from the real to the plausible to the extreme where what we're doing is, you know, these game mechanics are using the skills that you would use as a doctor, right? And so we're making yeah. these cases harder and harder and harder. Sometimes we stretch that into cases that haven't actually happened, but could plausibly happen that are incredibly difficult. And then into extreme cases to really push the limits of those skills. And, you know, as long yeah. as we maintain that, you know, that, the, that level of credibility, right? For doctors, we can continue to suspend their disbelief and it just continues to be fun. And, you know, they're, they're continuing to improve their skills as an unintended, cons almost an indirect consequence of play. It does seem like there would be, you know, almost by, by you know, using the Angry Birds example, product des designers, whether it's a game or not, could probably benefit from almost just doing teardowns to a degree, right? Like from, you know, for just from what you described, it sounds like, you know, a lot of iteration around the core loop of like pulling back that bird and that is one iteration of a thing and kind of doing a bunch of cycles on that to make sure that thing itself is is sort of fun and easy and relatively addictive. And then kind of keeping people in that channel of, of um, as they're developing sort of competency and how to use your platform, like making it super easy in the beginning um, to kind of get that that dopamine hit and making it kind of progressively more difficult. Would it be fair to say that like short of, short of, you know, if you're building a, a, a SaaS CRM system or something like that, uh, do you, do you feel like there would be applicability in terms of kind of studying game design and how folks architect these sorts of experiences and be able to kind of apply them? And, and if so, is there anywhere you would recommend folks kind of go or try to, cause it, it does seem like it's a little bit of a dark art almost, but it does seem like there could be some patterns that could be abstracted. 100%. Uh, is that fair or no? 100%. Okay. So when I say it's, it's a deep discipline, it doesn't mean that it's yeah. 
it's hidden, right? So, yeah, you know, right. the game, in fact, the game community is incredibly altruistic and everybody loves to share what they're doing. So, yeah. you know, as long as you mean, basically respect, you know, you respect the art, you in the science, you go in and, you know, literally you, what you described, like there are literally blogs, right? You know, I think there's Deconstructor of Fun is one of them. You know, there, there are literally these blogs okay. where they will take successful games and break them apart, break apart their core loop, break apart the outer loop, and really distill from either an economics perspective or a neuroscience perspective, why it works, why it's so effective. And I think, yeah, yeah I mean, that that's the thing, right? If you're not looking for shortcuts, but rather, you know, you're really trying to deeply understand how these things work, the neuroscience of it, the, ec the economics of it, then there's a tremendous amount of knowledge that has been gained in the in the games industry that's relevant across you know anything where you trying to you know basically motivate motivate a user to do something correctly or teach a user to do something correctly or help a user become more efficient. It seems like you've sort of stumbled upon I don't know how many other similar types of products kind of exist in in healthcare or otherwise but I mean it seems like you've sort of stumbled upon a new way of and I I'm, I'm struggling for the words but I mean it's it's I would imagine most game designers are thinking about purely kind of fun and distractions and things like that. And it seems like you've sort of figured out a way to kind of help people level up in very practical, real world kind of skills through the act of kind of gameplay. Do you see that kind of being a new paradigm kind of in the future? Because it seems like there would be applicability in all kinds of sort of areas. Is that something that's already happening or... Um, are you still pretty, you know, kind of pioneering in that regard? Oh God, I hope so. Um, so I, I think that, uh, <laughs> meaning like there is so much opportunity to take what's going on in the games industry and apply it elsewhere. The most obvious, you know, yeah. the, the most direct one is, you know, K-12 education. Yeah. I mean, my yeah. goodness, like how do, where do I even begin? Right. I mean, like, you know, the education system is yeah. very optimized toward a model where, you know, books are expensive and, you know, you have these sort of yeah. lecture formats and whatnot. You know, I think of things that, you know, so many things that I even learned in math class that didn't actually make sense to me until I started, you know, either applying it in video games or seeing it in video games. You know, yeah. think about all the things, you know, all the things we remember from where in the world is Carmen San Diego, right? That we remember better than anything <laughs> we ever learned in, in, a, in a history class. You yeah. know, there are a few companies that are doing it, but the need is so much greater than what is being done to fill the need. I mean, the, the example that come, like one example that comes to mind, um, there's this great series of games uh, called Dragon Box, where literally like yeah. they're puzzle games. And you know, you're, yeah. you're playing this puzzle and you're trying to you know, move these icons and balance them across you know, different sides of this puzzle. And it kind of feels like you're playing a, a you know, board game or a puzzle game. Only around level 19 did I realize when I was playing this, whoa, this is teaching me how to balance algebraic equations, right? Huh. But it didn't come in and hit yeah. me over the head of, hey, today we're gonna learn algebra. You know, here's an algebraic right. equation. Right. Da, 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 da. What it did is it distilled down what is the fundamental mental skill that I need in order to be able to do this, yeah. and then found a much yeah. more fun and interesting way to represent that. And only after it had, you know, I had played through a game that really honed those skills did it start showing me how to apply it to math. Especially as like independent game developers, I mean, it seems like from what I understand about the industry, it's it's pretty dominated by like the EAs and the riots and the things like that. And it's very, very difficult to kind of break through that, the machine that they're able to kind of deploy from a paid acquisition perspective and otherwise. But I mean, it seems like as an indie developer, especially being able to go after these niche, almost like B2B kind of use cases have, you know, there's a lot less noise. There is, it seems like even more promising revenue potential, right? Where you're not the, the 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 math as I understand it with a lot of games is you know we're acquiring a user for three bucks and we're hoping that we can make three twenty five out of them through yeah the you know, margins get really thin I mean, in, in in free to play games yeah it just seems like there's a there's just a tremendous kind of uh, monetization opportunity and a lot less noise for 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 doing this I'd, I'd be shocked if this doesn't become you know much much more common. Well, I think the the important thing though is, I mean, remember there, you know, with we talk sort of this indie game community which exists, but there's a you know a pretty bad signal to noise ratio, right? And that you know anyone okay. can go and the tools are there, right? Anyone can make games, yeah. And so if you don't have that experience of having, you know, it's like yeah. making a movie, right? Everyone's a movie director, 
everyone has ideas in their sure. head of what would be a fun game, but ultimately that exercise is incredibly difficult. And mm -hmm. so having that, the, the, the sort of experience and humility that comes with having tried to create fun games, succeeded in certain cases and failed in others, right? That experience is yeah. really what tells you how to build the right thing. So yeah, I mean, it's not just a matter of like being an indie per se, but if you sure. have that experience, which you know you can have earned either by creating you know successful indie games or by working in the industry, right? You then take that yeah. experience and then you go and say, "Yep, let's go start a small mobile studio that is focused on you know this business problem." There's you know substantial mm -hmm. opportunity there, and I think I think the games industry yeah. is going to see a lot of growth that way. So, in terms of Level X itself, where do you see things headed? I mean, you mentioned you mentioned AR. Um, a while back, VR seems like an obvious potential application. I know you're doing some stuff with space. <laughs> uh, where, where where is Level X kind of headed? Oh boy! All right. Well, look, we can we can deal with those one by one. So, uh, from a VR perspective, um, I mean, we've actually brought you know thousands of medical professionals through VR experiences because we're built on game technology. Our content yeah. also, you know without too much effort can run in VR. So um, we've, we've built okay. VR experiences that are specific to, you know, we use them at conferences and, you know, uh, with partners and things like that. Again, you know, thousands of medical professionals and doctors through VR, we've brought half a million through mobile experiences. So, you know, VR just doesn't yeah, have that installed wow. base yet to give us that scale, but there's lots yeah. of fun and interesting things that we that we do with that. You mentioned yeah. space. You know, I think earlier in the discussion, you'd mentioned, you know, you build things at just a higher quality than what anyone else is doing, and all of a sudden opportunities arise. And our partnership with Trish, the Translational Research Institute for Space Health, we're building a platform for NASA. Um, for space health, that literally came out of, you know, them discovering us and saying, you know, they, they have a number of, you know, if you told me a year ago, hey, Sam, you're going to be working with, you know, building a, a platform for NASA, I'd be like, to do what? Um, only when I started <laughs> understanding the challenges that they're facing on the, you know, on, on planning the deep space missions for, for the moon and Mars, you know, there's some incredible challenges and we are incredibly well suited to help them address those. Um, and so, yeah. you know, these opportunities arise that you had never anticipated. Um, and so there, you know, I'm happy to talk more about it, um, what, what we're doing there. Um, what's exciting is not only, you know, what we're doing to help train astronauts for, for difficult space scenarios, but what's great is actually a lot of the technology that we're developing as part of that project for NASA, um, we're actually using, um, we have a lot of terrestrial applications for. So the things that we're building as part of that project, both the content and the technology is going to end up in our games that doctors are going to be able to play. Yeah. What are the, I mean, I guess, what are the, the kinds of challenges that maybe are unique to that domain relative to just sort of general medical practice? Well, so let's, let's, let's do, do an example, right? So you're, uh, you're, you know, nine months into the Mars mission on the way to Mars, right? All of a sudden, yeah. you know, one of the astronauts grabs his chest, you know, rolls over unconscious in zero gravity. You know, it's going to be the flight surgeon because it's always the flight surgeon. You've seen movies. Um, and so and so what do you do? Right. Um, you know, you need to figure out what's going on. And so, you know, you have fewer diagnostic tools. Right. You know, you can't you can't bring an MRI or a CT or an X-ray into space. Right. You, you know, your only yeah. imaging modality yeah. is ultrasound. So, all right. So you grab the ultrasound probe and you start looking at the heart. The heart changes shape over time in microgravity becomes more spherical, blood flow changes. And so how do you know what you're looking at is normal for an astronaut that's been in space for nine months or abnormal? And then beyond that, right? So today, you know, they have an ultrasound rig on the ISS, right? But what happens? You've got a radiologist on the ground in Houston who's directing the astronauts, all right, you know, turn to the left, give me a better view of the atria. They're directing them to manip manipulate the, the ultrasound, and he's reading it in real time. When you're nine months into the Mars mission, it can be up to a 40-minute round trip just to send the signal because of the speed of light. So you have to be able to do this stuff Jeez. independently, and you have to be able to train astronauts just in time to be able to deal with these scenarios. So wow. wide range of problems from both the unique medical considerations that happen only in space and microgravity and the other considerations. You've got specific training yeah. challenges. You've got um, human factors considerations. And the fact that all the astronauts' time for training has already been booked. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Astronauts had to train for years for 
the Apollo missions, which were five days. The amount yeah, of time they're yeah. going to need to train on navigation systems, emergency scenarios, landing, you know, all of these different systems that are going to be way more complex. They don't have time to get a medical degree in space health. That's uh, that's exciting. That's that's super cool. Just in terms of in terms of VR, you mentioned kind of the expenses and issue and things like that. What that is something that folks have been kind of talking about for for a long time. But I mean, in earnest, really, it seems like, you know, when Oculus came out and some of that kind of stuff, but it still hasn't really gone mainstream, it seems like, relative maybe to some other sort of technologies that had kind of a faster adoption curve. Price is obviously kind of one component of that. But are there other sort of barriers to adoption that kind of VR kind of presents? And how, how do you how do you think about that kind of as a modality? And what do you what do you think needs to happen for it to to kind of really hit the mainstream? Well, yeah, I mean, it depends on, I mean, I can, I can sort of talk to you. There's, you know, some clear mistakes that are being made in terms of the kinds of VR content that's typically made in healthcare. Um, okay. And, you know, sort of similar to like what we, the conversation we had about gamification is, you know, there's a lot of mistakes being made in terms of just how people are creating content. Um, okay. The, I'll, I'll give you an example, right? Like, you know, we talked about uh, mechanism of action, understanding how a drug works. There's a lot of um, yeah. training content around that, including, by the way, often drug companies will produce these high quality, you know, Pixar level v animations that illustrate how a drug mm -hmm. works. And those are great. But what they've tried to do over the last few years is, you know, they've they've been, oh, we should make that in VR. So what they do is they yeah. take, you know, something that you look gorgeous and would play on a big screen at a conference right? And 20 doctors could watch it at once. And what they do where, you know, you're flying around the cell and you're flying around the molecule and it looks great. And what they do is they shove it, put you in an egg chair and they shove it into a VR headset. And now all of a sudden you're in a VR headset and you're flying around this, this molecule. Well, what does that do? Right? If you understand, you've ever, you know, gotten seasick on a yeah. boat, right? Yeah. That's because what's happening yeah. is you're feeling motion, right? You're on the boat, you're feeling motion, but you're inside. So you're not seeing anything move. And what that does is it creates an inconsistency between your vestibular system and your optical system. And that triggers nausea, right? Which is why a poorly designed VR experience will trigger nausea, right? And so there's a lot yeah. of these best practices that aren't being followed. I think as people get better and better at that, you know, these problems are going to start going to start going away. Yeah. There's no question in my mind, I think what the, the sort of between AR and VR and headsets and all that, you know, eventually, mm -hmm. if you just follow the technology curve, what's going to happen is these things are going to get much lighter, um, which much better form factors, right? So it's literally going to be a lot more like wearing a pair of glasses. And I think, yeah. you know, when you have the opportunity to, you know, wear a pair of glasses, walk around and literally, you know, your Google Maps is projected in front of you. It's doing facial recognition on the people who walk up to you, you know, giving you their LinkedIn profile. And, you know, it's just providing great contextual information where you don't have to keep looking down at your phone all the time. Like that is going to be a mm -hmm. user experience that is going to provide, you know, that's the sequence of killer apps that's going to drive the widespread adoption of headset technology. Um, and then, you know, we're going to kind of see different convergence and, and variety in, in AR and VR headsets. How do folks in your world think about, you know, obviously there's been sort of a, a I guess, a tech kind of backlash in general in the last 12 months, call it, around a whole bunch of things. Um, and they're kind of conflating a whole bunch of stuff. But one of one of them has been around, le the ideas around like leveraging game mechanics to kind of make things stickier, like hijacking people's brains, basically, like understanding that evolutionary kind of psychology that you talked about um, to make people kind of play things longer or look at their devices more or things like that. And as we, especially as we think about VR and kind of having headsets and things like that kind of attached to people kind of at all times. How, how, how do folks in your world think about that stuff? Are they not kind of as worried about it as sort of the general population? Is it mostly kind of upside? How do you, how do you think about that kind of stuff? Well, I mean, in my world being the world of using it to make games for doctors, you know, here we're using this technology to help physicians improve their skills and practice on things. Yeah. Otherwise they practice on live human beings. So, I mean, here it's right. like the way I look at it, it's like any, I mean, You've heard this before, but like any technology, it could be used for good. It can be used for evil. Video, television is that way, right? I mean, you can create, you know, just absolutely, you know, terrible, mindless content that people watch endlessly, you know, or you can create, you know, I've learned more from the History Channel than, you know, it's stuck much better with me, the things I've learned from the History Channel than things I've, you know, necessarily learned in history classes. So it really depends <laughs> yeah. how it's applied. Yeah. Um, and that, yeah. that is really crucial. I mean, this stuff is more powerful. 
So, you know, it can be used to drive, you know, it, these things are used to drive behavior, right? Ultimately, you know, what we're doing in games is, you know, we're using technology to, to drive behavior and, you know, that can be for good or for, or for bad. I mean, there are companies, for example, that are using game mechanics as a treatment modality. Like there's FDA mm -hmm. approved now digital therapeutics where you can use games to treat ADHD um, and PTSD and, you know, with tangible impact, right? Because we're rewiring the brain. That's an incredibly positive outcome, right? Obviously you can, you know, drive it in the other direction if you wanted to. Um, Right. And, you know, we need to be extremely cognizant of what we're doing and, and cognizant of the power of, of these techniques. Well, Sam, this has been uh, fascinating. I mean, it's, it's just, it's super impressive what you've, what you've sort of put together. And I know it was kind of, you know, at least the origins of it were, <laughs> if not accidental, you know, serendipitous at a minimum, but um, it's, it's been, it's, it's, it's super fascinating to kind of see how you've taken it and evolved it and, and grown it. For folks that are looking to learn more, where, where should I send folks either about uh, Level X itself or, or kind of what you're thinking about things? Where, where should I send folks? Sure. There. So Level X, www.level-ex.com. Um, you can, you know, learn about our games and our team and, um, what we build. Um, I have a blog at glassenberg.com. Um, and then you can also follow me on Twitter at, uh, at Sam ZG. My guest today was Sam Glassenberg. For more ideas on how to disrupt your own industry, visit us at www.digintent.com. And if you enjoyed the episode, we'd love a review on iTunes or whatever platform you use. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time.